Hello. I see we have a bit of adjusting to do. The name is Beatty. Dinosaur News, British People's League. John Beatty, leader of the British People's League, broadcasting to you this November 6, 2015. We are beginning a historic broadcast today. Reading number one, first reading. 2015, copyright, all rights reserved. Canada's secret civil war, 1978 until, with a question mark, by the real John Beatty. Note, the reason I had the honor of being the would-be spokesman for the would-be administrative legal coup will be fully explained in my follow-up autobiography. Not now. Not now. As I do not want to divert your attention away from the incidents of the secret civil war herein. Preview. It is truly ironic, August 20th, 2011, race riots and anarchists have brought the inner cores of major cities in Britain to their knees. On this date, I finally began typing for this book. What you're about to read here should have been started 20 years ago. Dictations for this book started after much delay, September 16, 2015. While all of Europe, including Britain, are being invaded by the third world. What you're about to read here should have been started at least 25 years ago. Coming full circle, the last race riots took place and are taking place in the motherland in the first years of this new century. So how does a book outlining a supposed secret civil war in the Dominion of Canada relate to race riots in the United Kingdom? Well, let's get on the roll, and I will tell you. Let's get on the roll, and I will tell you. A corny analogy. You own a thousand acres and a tribe has moved in next door. You own a thousand acres and a tribe has moved in next door. By hook and by crook, the tribe is illegally swallowing up your thousand acres. Okay, let's call the land the Dominion of Canada, and let us call the tribe the mixed multitude of the rest of planet Earth. Let us call the tribe the mixed multitude of the rest of the planet Earth. This country has always been controlled by Anglo-Celtic Saxon white tribes with native Indian tribal cooperation in unison with the same culture, history, and ancestry, in unison with the same culture, history, and ancestry of those controlling the old white nations of the old British Commonwealth. Then suddenly, bingo, one of the pieces of the matrix is being gobbled up. That piece used to be called the country of Rhodesia. Rhodesia was well known up until the United Nations interference as the breadbasket of Africa. Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, is the basket case of Africa. The loss of Rhodesia emotionally upset the aforementioned white controllers because a piece of the brotherhood was eliminated. Being raised by my wonderful Scottish-English Croft family in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, I felt that in a small way, I was in with the controllers, even if at the bottom of the ladder. However, this book is not an autobiography. Allow for a brief referral. Scottish and English roots to the core, I was steeped in British and British-Canadian traditions. 
My father served in the British Commonwealth Training Program at the tail end of World War II. Mother, brother, and I aboard the Her, His Majesty's ship Aquitania coming back to Canada after a visit with him in Old Blighty while he was still serving. Father also took part in British machinations during the Suez Crisis in the mid-50s, serving in Egypt as Royal Air Force. I became a teenage air cadet in the Royal Canadian Air Force and later a member of the Royal Canadian Air Force itself for five years. Honorable discharge. This led to a good stint in the Royal Canadian Legion as an ordinary member. Back to Rhodesia. I too was alarmed about a piece of our extended history, a piece of everything I read about as to our ignorant white exploitation. I could care less if it was white exploitation. I was what I was, and I am what I am, a product of British imperialism, mind you, in the Dominion of Canada. There was a new toy out in the technical world at the same time as Rhodesia was being slaughtered by the United Nations, etc. This new toy was called a codophone. Being the political yapper that I have always been, I made use of the broadcasting gizmo, Codophone, as an outlet to reach at least some of the general public. It was a fantastic device back then, yet simply the forerunner to the modern telephone answering machine. Put yourself in my shoes. I felt a piece of me was being ripped out of my body, yet I had no means to scream to the world that the murder of Rhodesia must be thwarted. Bingo! Thus began my three minutes or so of broadcast steadily from 61 Kingsmount Park Road in the Upper Beaches area of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I began, Rhodesia calling, Rhodesia calling was my urgent plea to assist our cousins far away. Thousands of visitors phoned in to hear my dramatic urgent appeal to help save Rhodesia. End of preview to the book brought to you today November 6, 2015 by the British People's League Dinosaur News. Chapter 1. Tie in with a supposed secret civil war in Canada? Obviously, I was not the only one concerned about the slaughter in Rhodesia. A segment of the elite of our people were ready to move. I had the honor of knowing that my tapes inspired the beginning of an enormous backlash as my fellow Anglo-Celts had had enough of the deliberate planned conspiracy to genocide our people. If it could happen to Rhodesia, then just as surely it could happen to Canada. We shall unveil how the vocal inspiration provided by yours truly shook up our elite to do more than just grumble. In fact, plans were set in motion to walk the walk. You can believe what you wish from the following pages. Proof of strange middle-of-the-night activities throughout Canada will be offered. Most unfortunately, as the theme of this book was not successful, we are in thin ice now as to naming names. There will be some companies mentioned and a few individuals where possible. Now, what do I mean by where possible? In today's field of legal litigation, lost relatives are resurrected. Out of nowhere to complain. Lost relatives are resurrected out of nowhere to complain meaning the risk of an injunction is a potential out there. And it, it, it is a potential, so it limits our exposure. We want this book to be distributed without hindrance. There will be reference to strange news clippings 
in well-known national press in Canada. I shall build the case for what took place as best I can. I shall build the case for what took place as best I can. It is your job. You, you, it is your job. Where's that finger? Give him the finger, Beatty. The camera here is weird and my gut. Ah, I guess you're not going to get the finger, folks. But it's your job out there. to research find and read the references outlined to confirm for yourself the truth in the following pages. These pages merely point the way. No one likes conceit. I simply was successful beyond my wildest hopes in stirring up a call to action, whereby serious talk took place in a couple of the poshest private clubs in Canada. Rhodesia was the catalyst and yours truly, the mouthpiece. The head honchos of Anglo Corporate Canada were to be the new open administration of Canada. Administrator, as in Canada's constitution based on the British North America Act. Pierre Trudeau was changing the face of Canada by liquidating British Canadians, along with René Levesque moving to pull Quebec out of Confederation. Our civilian and military shadow cabinet started to plan in earnest. The screams of the British Canadian corporate wives reverberated throughout these posh private clubs. Yes, the wives overheard the most insane discussions that they had ever heard muttered from their pompous hubby's lips. A what? A legal administrative coup in Canada? Some of the wives, not so friendly, tipped off the other side. Later into the book, you may have the pleasure of trying to figure out who the other side consisted of. The variables are complex. When the multi-cult power brokers realized that our boys were dead serious, these same power brokers made sure that our ringleaders had to flee. Immediately, our boys hid in Alberta until the smoke cooled off. In fact, our eight brave warriors, who had the guts to risk all, put the old slogan to work, one step backward, two steps forward. They hid out in the mansion residence of the then president of a famous Canada-wide meats company. Their limo driver, who resigned from a Toronto area police force to join the Patriots, whisked them to safety at dangerous top limo speed to Alberta. With the wild administrative plan hatched, these men became clearly marked for death. Obviously, the only way they would live would be with the success of the undertaking. Like all wars, be they open, secret, civil, or whatever, the blood of the martyr is the seed of success. These brave establishment men, the first up to the plate, put any criticism that they were snobs to permanent rest. It was now the turn of the ordinary rank and file of our peoples, off-duty firemen, police, military, etc., to be fully advised as to the unbelievable plan to take our country back. Briefings took place. I personally witnessed the police station parking lot packed as the then head of Stelco Canada, Stelco Steel, urged patriotic men in blue to join with us in the dead of night activity to save Canada. This on Coxwell Avenue on the edge of the Beach District, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This get-together was also confirmed to me during the usual briefing. Usual briefing from Hazel, my passed away wife. Hazel was the go-between. The big shots wouldn't be caught talking to yours truly, the wild man. Hazel, respectable charge nurse at the Wellesley Hospital, was the go-between. They briefed her. She came home off shift and briefed me. So the get-together in Coxwell Avenue was also confirmed to me during the usual briefing from Hazel when she returned home after the boys' prior briefing to her in the Wellesley Hospital boardroom. The first shots were fired Boxing Day 1978 in the Laurentian. At exactly 6 p.m. on that same Boxing Day 1978, I was escorting my two daughters from my first marriage from London, Ontario for their monthly weekend visit. For whatever reason, 
I turned at exactly 6 p.m. and looked out the back window of the bus. It was a typical dreary cold December evening. Suddenly, I had goosebumps and quivered. I discovered over that weekend that two heroes, very well known to Hazel and through Hazel to me, our first go-between, I discovered they had died at exactly 6 p.m. from machine gun fire in an ambush in the Laurentians at exactly 6 p.m. Can you imagine how I feel recalling hundreds of times that premonition, the alarm that went through my system while looking out the Greyhound bus back window at the exact moment that the heroes died? We coordinated them D and dumb throughout the Civil War. What? Shots fired? Who fired what at whom? Planes, small planes, had assembled at Buttonville Airport north of Toronto, Canada. Their mission? To have a chat with the Premier of Quebec, René Levesque, over the Christmas holidays 1978. The Toronto Sun Thursday, December 28, 1978, printed this most peculiar short blurb written by columnist Gary Dunsford. Heading, quote, 25 words or less, Cormier says they are closing down René Levesque until after the holidays. Seems a team of French chimney sweeps is coming in to clear out the Premier's nose. Under the photo, René Levesque in for a sweep. And ending the first reading, I would throw in, and it'll come up later in the, in the future readings, the French chimney sweeps were, in fact, French paratroopers. What? So that's the scoop, the first reading. And from now on, each YouTube will be reading second reading, third reading, fourth reading, etc., until the book is read to you on YouTube first. Now, while we're doing all this, we mustn't forget our obligations to plug our good friends, our mates, our buddies at Candor, C-A-N-D-O-U-R, candor.org.uk. Great publication, Candor, C-A-N-D-O-U-R, candor.org.uk. Click in and have a look around. Great stuff. Historical, modern, you name it. And I also want to put in a plug for the League of the South, our good Confederate flag. <laughs> our good Confederate flag, yes, it's somewhere on this property. Our good Confederate friend has written a brilliant editorial that may be producing a future issue of Candor. So that's it. British People's League taking an unusual twist and turn. The Dinosaur News. Brought to you today by yours truly, John Beatty. So we'll catch you at the next reading. The next reading of Canada's Secret Civil War, 1978, until with a question mark, by the real John Beatty. Keep it legal. God save the Queen.